Hey you! Yes you, dear animator. Are you perhaps aware that we live in a hashtag society? Animation takes a lot of time and as animators we have to find ways to speed up our process so we don't end up falling behind everyone else. Including computers! I take it back, we don't live in a society, we live in a dystopia. In this video, I will give you some tips you probably never heard before. Wanna use decoration brushes to animate hair? How about tips on creating quick and easy backgrounds with AI colorization? Interested in speeding up your line or process with vector layers? Or perhaps you want to learn how to quote-unquote sketch with 3D models? And much, much more. Now let's get this straight. As you might have guessed, this tutorial is not beginner-friendly. It is instead made for more experienced animators who are looking for ways to utilize Clip Studio Paint's features to speed up their animation process. With all that being said, let's jump into it. Who likes doing backgrounds? Come on, raise your hand. No sane person, that's who. Thankfully, I've cracked the code. You see, back in the day, I used to spend like an hour or more on each background I did for my animations. I was such a pure, innocent noob, and I did not know that there were shortcuts to be had during this tedious part of the animation process. But now, I know better. Look at these lovely, lovely backgrounds I did. You might be wondering, wow, how many hours did this take to make? No hours, that's the answer. First thing we gotta do is set up our 3D model. Thankfully, the Clip Studio Paint Asset Store is lovely and has plenty of models to pick from. Upon downloading it, it will appear in our material catalog, and then we just drag it onto the canvas. Now, in Clip Studio Paint, above any 3D model, you will find these icons. I separated them into three main categories, as you can see in the image. First, there is camera movement. This moves the camera but keeps the model in place. You can rotate the camera, move the camera in any direction, or zoom in and out. There's also model movement, which moves the model itself but keeps the camera in place. Here, you have a few options. You can move the model in any direction, disregarding the 3D surface. You can rotate the model around one of its edges, you can rotate the model around one of its faces, you can even rotate it around its axis. And finally, there is an option that moves the model in any direction, but this time keeping the 3D surface in mind. And the final category is the snap category. This is used to snap your model to a specific size, position, or rotation relative to another model. And now that we looked at the buttons above the model, we can look down at the buttons below the model. What do they do? Well, this one moves between the models on the canvas. This one opens the subtool detail window. This one opens a window with the pre-made camera angles. This one centers the object. This one snaps the object to the 3D surface. This one resets the model back to its original position. This one resets the model's scale. And this one resets the model's rotation. We won't be focusing on any of these for now, except the screwdriver icon. The screwdriver icon is my best friend. Now that we have our model and we finished setting up the camera angle that fits the scene, we're gonna play with the light settings. Click on the little screwdriver icon to open up the subtool detail window. Now here we will find the light source category which we will be focusing on. To set the direction of the light source, drag the light's position across this ball. Once you are satisfied with the direction of your lighting, you can change the light's color and intensity. You can also change the color and intensity of your ambient light. To put it simply, ambient lighting is the secondary lighting source that doesn't have a direction. You can basically go off here, combine any color options your card desires for some really interesting effects. With our base background and colors done, we can go to the next stage and extract the lines. Wait, wait, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Before we do this, we need to rasterize our 3D layer. To do this, right-click on the layer and select Rasterize from the pop-up window. This will turn your 3D layer into a regular old 2D image. Just a little tip from me to you. Don't forget to copy your rasterized layer. Make sure you have two images of your model, okay? This will be important later. Trust me. Now we can finally extract the lines. Find the layer property window and click the extract line option as you see in the example. Proceed to remove the black fill as this could easily mess up with the entire process. Play around with the settings. Make sure your lines are as clean and visible as possible. Okay, okay. Now that we have our lines, we need to make the layer transparent. To do this, we rasterize it again and then go to edit, 
convert brightness to opacity. This will turn all the whiteness in our image completely transparent, leaving only the lines we've extracted. Okay, next step. Now, remember how I said we needed two copies of the rasterized image of our 3D model? Yeah, I told you it's important. The layer above will be our reference layer. It is the layer with our line art aka the lines we've extracted in the previous step. While the layer below is just the regular image of our rasterized 3D model. This will be our base color layer. To mark our line art as the reference layer, we need to click on this little icon here, and that's basically it. We now have to select the layer with our base colors, and we go to Edit, then proceed to click on Colorize, use Hint Image and Colorize. This will AI generate some colors based on the colors of our base color layer. Thanks to AI colorization, our plain looking 3D model looks so much more detailedly shaded now, especially after playing around with some layer styles and also opacity settings of the layers. And now we can finally move on to some finishing touches. This is basically the part where I just play around with the colors. To change the color settings, go to Edit, Tonal Correction, Color Balance. And after using some fancy brushes, after 10 minutes of work, I am done with the background. And look at it go! Now, let's say, in some hypothetical scenario, you weren't able to find the 3D background you wanted, and you want to instead build your own one. So, let me teach you how to use 3D primitives. To find 3D primitives, go to your material catalog, then proceed to go to the 3D section, and under primitives, you will find the models you're looking for. Drag them onto the canvas. If you paid attention in the previous section, you should by now know all about how to change your camera's position as well as your model's position, and all about snapping. But did you know that you can also squash and stretch your model? <laughs> when you click on your model, you should be able to see these little boxes. When you drag these boxes around, you can squash and stretch your model. So that's pretty useful for building unique shapes. Before I allow you to set off on your magnificent journey to create the 3D primitive background of your dreams, I will tell you this quick tip. Did you know you can lock the camera? Well, you can! Click on the screwdriver icon to bring out the subtool detail window. Upon finding the object list category and the camera inside it, you just... lock it. Yeah, this can be really useful when you want to focus on building a scene without worrying too much about the camera's movement. You can also lock your 3D models, you can lock the lighting, anything, so just, like, use it to your advantage, you know? After playing around with my primitives, squishing and stretching them to my heart's content, I got a pretty dope background out of it. But did you know you can add a texture? So, how do we create a texture for our 3D primitive? Well, to do this, we need to understand UV maps. Or was it texture maps? Maps in general, yeah. They are a flat representation of a surface of a 3D model, used as a guide when making textures. It's best to think of maps as digital paper folding. Much how you would fold a piece of paper into a cube, the same logic applies to maps. To create a map, you have to go to the subtle detail window by clicking the screwdriver icon below the model. Upon doing this, go to the primitive category and find the export map option. This exports the default map, and no matter how much you change the wireframe, no matter how much you squash and stretch your model, the map will look the same no matter what. Like, it will have a different wireframe, but it's still the same shape. And then you just, like, paint over it? But yeah, it can be a bit confusing, so let's go back to the papercraft analogy for a second. Let's say you are minding your own business, doing some fun paper crafts, and then you decide, hey, I want to make a cube, and I want to draw a picture on each side of the cube. So you create the base, and then you're ready to fold it, and... Some sides are upside down. Obviously. You didn't think of this, did you? The same logic applies to 3D models and their texture maps. I know it can be a bit hard to wrap your head around, so just look at this example texture map I drew. Use this as your reference. To add the texture, you just go to the previous section we talked about and open the texture, yeah, and you should be done. 3D primitives are extremely useful when creating backgrounds from scratch, as sometimes, you know, you just don't have the right background to work with. I recommend using them for cityscapes or just in general for simple objects that you have trouble picturing in your head and would like a 3D reference for. So we got our background and now it's time to fill it up with some characters. If you're like me, you hate sketching. You despise it. Oh, sketching is your least favorite part of art in general. So, 
What if instead of doing a new individual sketch for every frame, you just like... Copy-pasted the frames and adjusted them slightly? Wink wonk. How to do this? First, we need to make sure we're on the right frame. So look at your timeline, make sure you're on the right frame, and then click CTRL plus C. Now to paste it, click CTRL plus V. B where is my frame? Dummy, calm down, it's fine. Just right-click on the timeline and find your new copied frame. And then just select it and yeah, it's it's here. Your, your frame is here. Congratulations. Everyone clap! But now we just have two versions of the same frame. It's time for the liquify tool. Let us do a quick rundown of the liquify tool. What does push do? Oh, I don't know! It pushes and pulls the pixels of the image, silly billy. What does expand do? Oh, stop putting me on the spot! It expands the image, it's in the name. Look at it go, look at it go. What does that even mean? What does shrink do? Uh, uh, it, it shrinks the image? Exactly, you got one. You're, you're doing great, sweetie. What does push left do? Um, it pushes the selected area of the image to the left. Correct, what does push right do? Um, it pushes the selected area to the right. I know you had it in you, you're a smart cookie. And final question, what does twirl clockwise and twirl anti-clockwise do? Um... It's in the name? You did it! You congratulations! You got a gold star! Okay, now you know everything about the liquify tool. Me when I lie. Depending on your strength settings, your liquify tool will either have a very weak or very strong impact depending on how hard you press, and the hardness setting is basically like... Well, all you need to know is the smaller the number is, the more smooth looking your liquify tool strokes will look. So yeah, that's basically all you need to know. The liquify tool is extremely useful for sketching and even for line art in my opinion, as sometimes you just like, don't want to redraw the same frame over and over again, you just want to make a small adjustment, and the liquify tool is oh, perfect for that. Before we move on to the line art stage, there's something cool I want to show you. You know, sketching is all fine and dandy, but what if your sketch was a 3D model? To do this, drag your 3D model onto the canvas once again and put it inside your animation folder. Now right-click on the timeline and find the name of your 3D model. Look at it go, there it is! Now, every time you make a new frame, it will automatically copy the pose of the 3D model and the 3D model itself from the previous frame, meaning you can animate this 3D model. If you're only animating a pose, I would suggest locking the camera in place and just playing around with the joints until you get all the frames you need. But if you're trying to animate, let's say, a pose with some complex camera movement, here's what I do. As per usual, the first thing we do is find the little screwdriver icon below our model and open up the subtool detail window. In the allocate section, we find our camera folder and proceed to expand it only to select the current active camera. This will bring us to a whole different section of the interface. Now let's say you want to change the camera angle, position, or rotation, any of those two, or all three at once, whatever. Let's say you want to do that, but you also want to keep the previous position of the camera. How to do this? Well, you just duplicate the camera. Below the duplicate and delete buttons, you should be able to find the camera list. I use the camera list as a timeline. Let me explain. Since the camera list is in numerical order, I go through them one by one and change the camera angle slightly. This says each individual camera position has its own unique camera angle I can utilize later. Remember how I said you should lock your camera while doing posing? This is why. Because now you can unlock that camera and use these pre-made camera positions we just created. And when you put them together, you create a pretty good looking 3D in quotation marks animation. I cannot stress how useful this is when animating complex shots. If you're like me, you might have trouble visualizing objects, movements, you know, just poses in general in the 3D space, so this is insanely helpful. So basically what I'm saying is, sometimes for difficult shots, I recommend using a 3D sketch instead of a 2D sketch. For the line art, all I want to say is use vector layers. Vector layers are amazing as they give you the option to clean up your layers quickly. Instead of painstakingly deleting every messy line, what if you were just able to pull one stroke and that deleted the entire messy line? Then what? How to enable this? Well, we first need to find the tool property window of our eraser and click the little screwdriver icon. As per usual, this opens up the subtool detail window, and under the erase section, enable the vector eraser and make sure this option is enabled. I know many people don't know this, but basically, you can add vector layers to your timeline. All you need to do is delete the current raster layer and add a new vector layer. 
it will automatically show up on your timeline, but if it doesn't, right click on your timeline and find the layer you're looking for. Let me just tell you to keep in mind that with vector layers you cannot use the bucket tool, nor can you use the liquify tool, so if you want to use those tools you need to rasterize your vector layer. But did you know you can use decoration brushes on a vector layer? Let's say you want to animate hair without putting like any hard work into it. Like animating princess curls, it's way harder than it has any right to be. One stroke and we already have our hair, but it's not done yet. Before we do anything fun, we need to simplify our vector line by using the Simplify Vector Line tool. If it's missing from your toolbox, click on these three little straight lines. Now all you need to do is click Add from default, which will open up a pop-up window. And here you find the correct line section and add Simplify Vector Line. But also if you're missing the Control Point tool, also add that one too. When you simplify a vector line, it removes control points from your line. Look at these little boys. There's too many of them. We gotta delete some of them. Simplifying the vector line does this really quickly. And just like that, in a few strokes, your line already has much less control points than before. Now, what do we use these control points for? Moving the control point changes the shape of our line. And since this line is the decoration brush, it will change its shape as well which can be really freaking useful when animating hair. Just look at it go. It's best shown than said. So yeah, look at this example. Wowee. Now on to the coloring. Well, hypothetically, I could tell you all about how to create the perfect bucket tool. Um, no, I'm just gonna tell you to use this bucket tool from the asset store. It is literally a lifesaver. I will link it in the description. But basically, here's how you use it. Now, this isn't your regular bucket slash fill tool. This is more akin to a lasso tool with a fill function. If you listen to me and follow the previous step, making your line art layer your reference layer, all you need to do now is select an area you want to color, and that's it, it colors it automatically. I know from experience that I sometimes accidentally leave empty white spots on my coloring, so this is like life-saving, literally changed my life. Love it, slay. If you want to try these things out for yourself, but you sad poor soul don't own Clip Studio Paint, well, you're in luck. There's a link in the description to the Clip Studio Paint's official website, where you can download Clip Studio Paint's trial that lasts three months. Yeah, pretty cool. So do check it out, yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. And that's all I wanted to talk to you about. Well, that's a lie. There was a lot of other things I wanted to discuss, but sadly, this video's time is running out and it's already long enough as it is. I went into this video with the mindset of, I want to teach something new, something people might have not seen before. And honestly, I think I achieved it pretty well. I know this wasn't exactly a standard tutorial, I see it mostly as a collection of tips to use while animating rather than a step-by-step -step detailed process of how to animate. But yeah, all in all, I hope I taught you something new and I hope you enjoyed watching. Thank you, bye! Me when I lie. Again. Okay, I just wanted to show you this awesome drawing I did because I love it and I wanted to show it off in the video, but since the video is about animation, yeah, I didn't get the chance to show it off. So you're seeing it now. I used the AI colorization feature. Look at my OC. Look at how pretty she is. Okay, okay. Bye for real now.